<laughs> Welcome everybody to our Sunday at the Cajon Artist Talk series. Um, really thrilled to have Arlene McGonigal, Arlene McGonigal here. I wanted to um, let you know that although this is our last artist talk, there is an opportunity for you all to meet two of the other basketry artists on December 5th at our um, open house from 10 to 4. Lynn Francis Lunn will be here, and Jeanette Lane-Dienst, who works with the CV Baskets, will be here also. We also wanted to call your attention, we have a special event on Friday, December 10th, Winter Wonders, which you all may care to attend. And um, on the 4th and 5th, we have open house, uh, open weekend. If you would like to come back, maybe bring a friend who's not familiar with the museum. And finally, I want to remind you all that membership is what helps us to produce the programs that we do, so please consider membership. Um, Arlene McGonigal is going to tell you her story, and um, it begins at some point over on this side of the table, and it's currently over here at this side of the table, which um, was one of the most fascinating things that I learned when I went to her studio in Warren, Rhode Island, and had the opportunity to meet her, so welcome Arlene, and you all are in for a treat. Thank you, I, I have to say I'm really honored to be here, but also to be asked to be in the show of the baskets that are upstairs. There's some amazing basket makers, and it's such an honor to be a part of them. So I'm, I hope I'm going to be interested at, at interesting to you and that I'm not going to bore you, but if you fall asleep, I may throw something at you, okay? <laughs> so I have things ready to throw, so if you snore, you may get uh, a ball of wax linen. Um, my story begins uh, when I was a, a little girl. I lived on a farm in western Massachusetts. The town is called Hadley. Some of you may know about it. We had a vegetable truck farm, and we had baskets for very, very different vegetables. There was a, a huge basket for asparagus because we had to lay it flat. We had tomato baskets that we couldn't pile very high or else we'd have tomato soup. And then we had cucumber baskets that would come very narrow and they would fit in between the vines because if you put a basket or your foot on the vines, you would destroy the future blossoms. So we were very careful about our vegetables, but also we loved our baskets. However, because they were used every single day, they used to break down. So every winter, we would spend time in the cellar repairing our baskets and making boxes for shipping. So I grew up with this, baskets, but didn't realize my passion for them until I left my profession as a community organizer in Providence. My degree is in sociology from UMass Amherst, and I, was, I came to Providence because I had a job as a community organizer in the Elmwood section of Providence and absolutely loved my job. But then finances ran out and I needed another job. So when I married my husband, I decided to do something along art field. So I took art classes and so forth. But I was with him on a trip one day to Winter Park, Florida. And he was in business, and so he had business meetings every day. So I took the car and just drove. And I found myself in an orange grove somewhere around Orlando, and to this day it probably doesn't exist anymore, but there was a craft shop there. And in this craft shop was a woman who was making and teaching Appalachian Mountain basketry. Well, I stayed there for the full week, morning, noon, and night, and I made a basket. That's when the passion for basketry hit me, and I have had it ever since. So this was probably in the early 80s. And the basketry profession has taken many turns, and that's why you see a whole different array of things here. And I usually just talk about these and the baskets that are upstairs. 
but because Annie came to the studio and wanted me to talk about my very beginnings, I brought these. So I traveled the country in the early 80s making baskets. I found teachers all over the country. I went to Seattle to make cedar baskets. I, I went um, to, in Florida to make pine needle baskets. So I traveled the country for the, about five years going to teachers that I knew that specialized in certain aspects of basketry and I just fell in love with it and I couldn't stop. My enthusiasm for them still exists today but in a different format. So in 1985 I started teaching and I started selling. But as you know, these baskets and the shaker baskets are very well known and, and very functional and people are willing to buy these. So that's what I did. I used to sell them. I would go to craft shows. Um, galleries bought them um, and also there was a gallery in, in California and one in Michigan where I sold my work. But my hands were starting to wear out. So first of all, I'll talk to you about the Nantucket. How many people here know about the Nantucket baskets? I would say just about everyone. So I won't <laughs> oh, I won't bore you with that. <laughs> but I will tell you, these are the molds. Um, many of you know how they're made. These are the molds in which you make the basket over. So every single time you make this basket, it's perfect. I love that. I love that <laughs> element of perfection. However, so these are the bases that go in there. There's a screw. You screw it in, and I brought another one here so you could see what I do. So then I put the staves in. There's a groove inside of this. You put the staves in. You form it over there and let it sit for about a day. You spray it with water and let it take the shape, and then you start weaving. And you weave with material like this. You probably know it as chair caning material but we call it quality Nantucket reed. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's this whole element. To make handles, you have handle rims. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and I make my own handles on a shave horse with a draw knife. I do it the old fashioned way. And then there are rim molds. So there's molds for everything. You can't really go wrong when you make a Nantucket basket because the shape is there, the handle molds are there, the rim molds are there, and you're weaving and you're making these beautiful pieces of art. I still consider them beautiful pieces of art. That's what I did for a lot of years and that's what I taught for a lot of years. But then my hands, the last thing that happened to me, I was at a craft show and the couple ordered a nesting set of seven Nantucket baskets. And they wanted it for Christmas. So I said, I can do that. Well, that's when my hands started to, I did finish it. They, did, they were delivered. They were very happy with it. And my hands cried for months. I was at a point where I didn't think I'd be able to use them again and I didn't want to have the operation of carpal tunnel. So I was telling a friend of mine this story, this sad story, and I didn't want to stop basket making because I loved it so much. So she said, well, why don't you go back to school? I said, well, going back to school, how is that going to help me with basketry? That, I mean, you don't go to basketry 101 or 102 to college and and get a degree and you're making baskets differently. Well, I decided she was right. I needed to blast open my creative element. And so I went back to school, to UMass Dartmouth, to the fiber art, textile design and fiber art program. However, I was not a youngster at the time. And I didn't know if I could do it. So this dear friend said to me, Arlene, you're going to turn 50 anyway. You might as well do what you want to do. <laughs> and she was right. It's not like I'm holding my age. I'm going to get older. So 
I might as well do what I want to do with my life. So I went back to school. I applied to their surface design and fiber arts program, and they looked at my portfolio and they said, hmm, don't think so. Don't think so. You're not qualified. I said, well, what will it take to be qualified? And they came back and said, you need to take a year of undergraduate courses. You need to take art, because I had no art background other than just fooling around with it. You need to take art classes, you need to take surface design classes, you need to take architectural classes, and you need to take hand building classes. So I did that for a year. I loved it. I took five classes a semester, I was in the studio, I spent more time at that school than I did with my husband. <laughs> and it, I love my husband, but I'll tell you, it was stimulating. It was great to go back to school. It was really fascinating, and I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. So after the year of taking these classes with these young people in class, and I'm not sure, they were okay with me being there. Um, but it was good for me, and it was good for them. So I finally finished my year of undergraduate work. I put my portfolio together and I reapplied to the graduate program. Well, they took me. So that's step one. <laughs> and I, I love being there and I love the challenge. Now, I also had to take weaving classes um, in order to graduate with this, from this program. So I took loom weaving. I took off loom weaving. I did all the requirements, and I even took some printmaking classes, and that's another reason where Annie wanted me to bring some of the work that I have here. Um, it's all weaving, it's all textile, textile related, but by the fourth year of this program, I started feeling my oats. I knew I was onto something. And I absolutely loved it. I started making one-of-a-kind baskets. And this is what you see here, and this is what is upstairs. Um, my thesis was about the nested basket. This was the very first basket that worked when I was going back to school, because I made some that didn't work, and I have some of those with me, too. And that's what I love about the creative process. Even the ones that didn't work informed me of my next process, which was absolutely glorious, and it took me a while to learn that. So this was the first one in the series of nested baskets. And then I started making baskets, nested random weaving baskets, which is a technique. Random weaving is a wonderful technique. But then I brought it to a metal company that dipped it in copper, and it was another aha moment. So I had a series of aha moments that were leading to my creativity that fed my soul. So then I started making these baskets after I had graduated. So when I had graduated, I started working primarily with paper. And this is the paper that I use for most of my baskets. It's called Kyoshi paper. It's made in Japan. And they do make clothing and pillows out of it, and it's very, very strong. So I'll pass this around so you can see it. But it comes in a multi multiple of colors. <laughs> and I even spray paint some of it. I can dye it. It's such a strong fiber that it works really well with what I'm doing. So. Let me see if I missed anything there. So now, I started to do a lot of writing. And some of the writing was personal. Some of the writing was from great masters that have published. Some of the writings were from great poets, Emily Dickinson. And I started writing on a very kind of loose silk paper. And I fell in love with this writing, and I said, how can I incorporate it into a basket somehow? So then a friend of mine approached me and said, Arlene, I'm doing a basket, I'm doing a show on books, and I would like you to be a part of it. And I said, 
that's fine, but I don't do books. <coughs> so it challenged me, and this is what I love about theme shows. It challenges you to be creative. So I developed a basket book. It's upstairs, you can see it in the collection upstairs. And I started making, I did a series of six to eight of them. And they are all folded accordingly, according, fold into a basket. And that became so popular, people absolutely loved it. But they liked the writing inside as well. So this is handwritten, the old Palmer method, which people, young people don't do today. And there was a young man at the show who said, oh, that's computer generated, you printed that out. I said, listen, young man, have you ever heard of the Palmer method? Oh, no. Oh, no. No one, they can't even almost read handwritten um, script today. So I said, no, it's not. It's not printed out. I wrote it. Wow. Wow. They were so excited about writing. So it, it's almost a piece of art today because no one, the younger people, don't do the handwriting. So I really love the fact that he made me aware that this is a whole different element in my work, but I do a lot of writing. Now it's mostly my journals, but it was a lot of Emily Dickinson poems, who is really dear to my heart. Um, and so I incorporated, and I can pass these around or you can come and fill. So I incorporate a lot of writing in my work. So on the inner side of this is the written, but also the nest of writing. This is a cop basket that was made Ooh, a few years ago, and on the copper I wrote. Copper does a number of things to your hands, it tears it up. So I'm going back to where I started from, but this is copper foil that I have written on and then wove it into this basket. And this is another one, again, copper foil and copper wire, written word. Again, a third. And then this one, um, it's the pewter, I wrote on the pewter and, and put it in here. So from the very beginning of Hadley baskets to the Nantucket to the conceptually designed baskets, it was absolutely a challenge and fun and I'm still doing it today. My latest one is upstairs, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, it, it passes me right now, I can't think of the name of it, but my latest one is upstairs and I'm constantly developing. So one of the questions that came to mind when I was giving a, a talk like this, they said, how do you get your ideas? And my ideas are always working from the previous basket I made because this is very time consuming. It, it develops. Um, I usually have an idea of a basket when I start it, I sketch it out, and then I start to make it. And sometimes the form doesn't go what my mind's eye wants it to, so it takes it on its own element. So what I brought today are how I start. I use hardware cloth. And we all know what hardware cloth is, right? It's a wire that you buy at the hardware store. And it's galvanized. It comes in huge rolls. People use it to keep the rabbits and the deer and the muskrats out of their gardens. And I use it to make baskets. So I spray it with a automotive spray and then I wrap it in wax linen, which is this right here. It is a linen and it comes in several different cords. You can buy it in three, five, seven, and 12 strands and it adheres when I wrap it to the wire. So it really sticks really well when I wrap it to the wire and it comes in about 30 colors. So I just wrap it as if I'm sewing and this is what takes so long. But this is what helps me design the next basket. It's very meditative and I like doing boring work. <laughs> So once it's all wrapped, then I slice this paper 
and I make it into a format. So it's now woven into this wire, and you would never, you would think that I just am a good weaver, but I'm not. It's the wire that helps me weave. And I'm not always successful. So I have a lot of mistakes. And I even brought one to show you today. This is a mistake. Oh, and I have another one in here, but that's not a mistake. That's, an, that's another nest. It's a little crooked. And the reason why it's crooked is because I didn't use the right grain. You know how we have textile grain, you have it going one way, and you have paper grain that it has to go the right way. Well, I didn't slice the paper properly. I used it in different directions. And believe it or not, this paper is so strong, it took a transition, it transitioned the wire. So I like the basket, but it doesn't really work well because it's crooked. So you have to also you be aware of the grain of the fiber that you're working with in order when you're putting together a basket. Now I probably could have really stretched this and worked, but if it sat for a while, it goes back out of shape. The grain of the paper is so strong. So be aware, mistakes can help you design. And that is what I would like to say. So that is what I have for you today. I would love for you to ask me, oh, one more thing, because I did go back to school and I had to take many different courses. I was fascinated with printmaking and we had a printmaking department at UMass Dartmouth. And so I used the textiles and the weaving to produce prints. And so once again, you'll see the weaving, but you'll also see the writing. So that is some work that I had done on the press, and this is some other. This is some textile that I deconstructed, colored, ran through the press with paper, and this is what it looks like. So a number of different things have affected my work from going back to school and from weaving. Um, I still am doing, right now I'm in the process of changing my work um, because life happens to us. My husband passed away a few years ago and my work is changing. Well, can you believe that? So right now I am doing a wall piece and it is a kimono. And it's done with the same process in little strips. I'm doing squares of three by three and weaving this paper into it. It's a, I, I painted it gold and copper, and then I'm using words as well. So right now I have the sleeve done, um, and then I hope to have it installed sometimes in 2022 at the Providence Art Club. So your work changes with life. Your work changes with problems with your hands, <laughs> and I embraced all of it and absolutely love what I do. I'm still excited about basket making. However, since I was a little kid on a farm, the baskets have changed. There's a big component of contemporary basket makers now in this country, and they are doing amazing, amazing work. If you ever get the chance to see a contemporary basket making show, I highly recommend it. It, it, fill, it feeds more than just baskets. Um, we're doing, you know, structure work. We're doing material work. We all choose different material. To think that Jeanette is working with seaweed, and these baskets are absolutely glorious, and they hold a form. Um, I think the challenge we have as artists, all of us, how many basket makers are in this room? One, two, three. Well, I hope you all become basket makers. It's <laughs> such a fulfilling, fulfilling job. Um, and to be creative with it is a whole nother element. To just de define what you want to work with and how you want to work is, is really amazing. So I'm really open for questions, and I hope you have some today. And I also would love for you to come up and 
touch, feel, handle this work. It's not that delicate. Uh, it is pretty strong, even though it's flim, it falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, anyone have a question? Yes. Um, Oh, that is, it's a pattern that when you work with either odd or even, you can develop. Um, and so I just kind of worked it out on graph paper. And then it, they're all, and then this one has it too. It doesn't show as much. But um, you can work things out because of my weaving background on the loom. You can work things out on draft paper. And it's amazing what you will come up with. This is a product, I don't know, oh, this right here. This is Japanese cane. And I could get it before the tsunami hit in Japan. I don't know if I can get it now. I tried a couple of times to get it. I contacted the person that I bought it from in Japan and she has not responded. So I don't know if it went by way of the tsunami and if it will ever come back, but it's not dyed. It's a natural color and it grows that way. So I, I hope to, at some point in time, get it back again. However, I've kind of left this part of my basket making behind me. Um, I used to teach it for years and years and years and I still get joy out of these baskets. And I get joy out of seeing people who make these baskets. June was talking about making them. And, and it's so fulfilling if you ever have a chance to make baskets, whether they're traditional or contemporary, I highly, highly suggest it because it's so fulfilling. Um, and they don't always have to be functional. But when I do talk about functional baskets, people can identify with them. When I talk about conceptually designed baskets, it's a little more difficult to try and put your hands around or heart around or even head around. So, any other questions? Yes? How do you find out somebody who can teach the Nantucket? Well, June is going to talk to that. June, do you want to say it now? Um, sure. Um, I take classes in couture. Um, there's a woman, Lynn Barry, and she does, um, she has a studio and she can accommodate up to like eight people at a time. And she does um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, do the Tuesday night book, <laughs> Tuesday night class. You know, and it's, you know, three hours. And, um, you know, it's close. I live nearby. And, you know, Lynn teaches us how to. Um, we uh, do the staves and everything like that. We don't do the rings or the handles ourselves, you know? I highly suggest you talking to June afterward to get her name, because it really is just thoroughly enjoying. And now, a little frustration at first to get used to the materials, to get used to how to put them in, to get used to weaving nice and tight, to what, you know, how long to leave the cane in the water, and. And there's some, some elements that may be a little challenging, but oh, the end is such a reward. It really is. But just work through that frustration for the first couple of weeks. Work through it. Yes, Jim? My first basket class, I went to, she says, okay, we're going to do an eight-inch round. story, June. I had a lady that came to my studio and said, I want to make a handbag. I said, that's fine. Have you ever made a basket before? No, but I can make a handbag. I said, I think you ought to make a basket first, or at least five or six before you go to the handbag. 
but yeah, that's that's really a funny story. But that's usually true. We yeah. we think we, not sometimes we think we can do anything, and we can, but we have to have the first steps. We can do anything, but we just have to go step by step. Any other questions? I just I have a comment. Um, oh, okay. The, well, the basket is such a utilitarian object mm -hmm. that I just wanted to say that I think that your baskets are so lovely in how you have combined your interest in literature and your writing and text and book forms. They it, they blend together very easily. Oh, thank you, thank you. And that is a very interesting issue that you bring up. The craft and the art. And that discussion of are we crafters, are we artists? And my answer to that is yes, we are. <laughs> We're both, we really are. Because it takes a level of craft to get to this. I never would have gotten to this if I didn't do these or if I didn't do the pine needles, if I didn't do the shaker baskets, if I didn't learn how to fell a tree and, and pound off the black ash from the annual rings, I wouldn't have gotten to this level. So it had to start somewhere. And I do, I do thank my parents every day uh, for the farm life and, and learning how to fix baskets in the winter, even though we didn't fix them so that they were pretty and perfect we fixed them so that they were you know, they utilitarian, that we could use them. Um, and many of them fell apart, and we would bring them in in the winter and fix them up. And we were not, it, it was not a beautiful um, job fixing them up, but we, we used them every single day in the farm life. So they just had to be functional. And that's that whole dilemma between function and art. Um, and, and there's so many papers written on that, and I wrote some even when I was at school about that. You know, the, the people when I first went there to apply as an artist to be part of the uh, surface design program with an MFA, they looked at it and they said, baskets? You know? So we both had to learn together about creating functional and then creating art and I'm and I'm really glad that they took me and I think they're glad that they had me on on as a student because they learned a lot as well so you just have to follow your passion and who knows what will happen and that's what I did and that's what I love and that's what I continue to do however work does change and it constantly changes and I love the fact to be in theme shows because it forces you to think outside the box um, and forces you to go to another level of how can you bring your medium into another level. Did I see your hand up, Annie? Yeah, I was just uh, hoping you want to talk about this transition from the natural material to the hardware wire that, that offers you so many opportunities. How did you come to start using hardware? That's a really good question, and I think I'm going to have to think a little bit about that. But what I liked about the hardware, because I was talking about, I'm not sure I want to go there, but I'm going to, um, <laughs> women's issues and how sometimes we are just really hardwired and we're stiff. And, but how do we soften that up? So I use the, the wax linen to soften it. So to me, the conception and the conceptual design is also about a theory of women's rights and, and, and um, the stiffness, but yet the softness that we are, and how strong we have to be, yet how delicate. So there's that dilemma that I would go back and forth on, and that's where the hardware cloth and the wire and the stiffness Yet how could I form it to, ma to be malleable and to go with the flow? So that's why the materials came into effect, because of the theory of working on that. Now, I, I don't always like to talk about that, because it's, pretty, it's a pretty personal issue. And women's rights, I think, today have gone wide open. And even though most of the men traditionally in our culture very early on were male basket makers. 
there are women that are really con not only traditional makers, but some very fine throughout the world. You know, you, when you're working with Willow, you're working in England and Scotland and Wales, and those are the women that do the basket, and they grow the, the, the Willow. And that's, talk about being hand tough. Um, so, so men and women did do the baskets. The shakers, the men, did all the preparing of the black ash and all preparing all the wood, and the women did the weaving. So there was a combination of that. So when you look at baskets historically, there's a, a wonderful social element of it. But for me, it was the hard wire with the soft linen. Yeah? When you're designing a new basket, can you talk a little bit about your Pygo concept and <laughs> That's a great question too. Wow, um, I uh, I sketch it out in a sketchbook first, and then when I start working with the wire, cutting it up and preparing it, and I do do a lot of manipulation of the wire to make it soft so that I can plan it. I start with a sketch, and then when I start working with the wire. That goes out the window because the wire tells me how I can work with it. Just like this basket, I thought I was going to have a wonderful basket, but because I cut the paper wrong, it went out of form. So as I'm working on the piece, the wire, it tells me what I can do and what I can't do. And some of my best pieces, like the book basket upstairs, was formed because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So the wire and the, and the process of the weaving told me what I could do with it, and that's determined the shape. So I do try and start with a shape, but I would say 85% of the time it goes out the window when I start working with the wire. And, and sometimes I'm not patient with myself and I try and force it, and again, this is what I get when I try and force things. So, uh, um, I think that's kind of true in life too. When I try and force things, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. But I, I am constantly experimenting with materials. This is honeysuckle. I do a lot of collecting of materials. Um, this is a, 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 a basket that I did some, some work with. Um, I also put, I used to be a needlepoint, so I would put needlepoint work in my, my baskets. So I did fill them with um, some of my passion, but now it's mostly words that I'm working with, mostly words. And as I get older, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit more, should I say the word wise? Maybe not. Um, a little more, I don't know, thinking and, and um, slowing down with work, but thinking in terms of what's life all about. You know, and especially when my husband was sick for a few years, I was taking care of him. And that also brought in a lot of thought about life and almost a life review and where do I want to go from here. So, so my baskets are kind of a part of life review and, and what goes into them. And, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of that review. And I hope I'm not going to stop making baskets because that means I'm going to be ashes. <laughs> sure. If I might ask, um, what's the significance of the kimono to your husband and the project? Uh, that, you know, I haven't, that's a really great question and I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> um, I probably will when the kimono's finished. But I think it might have something to do with covering and protection. Um, but boy, I wish I had that answer now. But it was, it, it came to me, you know, it just came to me, you're doing a kimono. Well, I don't know anything about a kimono. I'm not a Japanese heritage. Why am I thinking kimono? But again, uh, you know, as I'm working, the answers I hope will come. And if they do, I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so please come on up. And, and look at, touch, feel, my, am I too late? No. Um, <laughs> no. And, and, and
please visit the baskets upstairs.